let's cover the filament shredder well the plastic shredder so once again where do we find this info uh, follow me on the log here the OSC shredder uh, concept design and CAD they're here already so what's the concept design look like and what's the CAD look like um, so concept is that's that's the concept two powerful motors three inch bearings three inch shafts there's a shredder chamber shredder mounting table uh, additional things in here that we don't show are naturally blades and spacers there's also scrapers on top which are fingers that come in from the like from the edges so you you're like clearing off any plastic that's I think it's just to clear the blades so the plastic doesn't end up collecting around the blades um, once again precious plastic shredder is a good thing to look at for comparison and here's I just put this thing forward here um, and here I showed the bearings on the inside and it's been we talked about that but I actually uh, let's put them outside and the way they do it in the precious plastic is what was the idea for putting them inside it was that the blades go right up against the flange of the bearing and therefore rotate against that and you have no wear no wear, wearing of parts but you can achieve the same if you put the bearings out and put a little collar that goes butts up against the blades now that's convenient in that the, the bearings are accessible and free of the melt the, the shred zone so it does make sense uh, so let's do this we do have this three inch bushing material just cut slices to whatever uh, size we need there so what does the CAD look like well shredder pro they say it costs 2200 bucks plus motor uh, they they actually do plus. have quarter inch plus what no plus motor which will be I don't know another thousand or two uh, the gear down is the big deal there motor they say no motor and gear down that's that comes kind of together typically what are their specs they got this particular figure of um, like 2000 they talk about torques that they're running at full operation of 2000 newton newton meters uh, what do we have well first of all let's think about what is that like 2000 can somebody picture what 2000 newton meters is let's talk about two kilograms two kilogram meters so newtons are yeah so here kilogram like yeah how much you're pushing at, at that meter distance like if you're spinning something it's pushing you so 2,000 Newton meters what they recommend is about 200 kilograms at one meter so like you have this lever you hold it there and it's 200 kilograms so right there it's a lot our system has three times this our system has three times this well say what Hello. Uh, it's we were using the har large hydraulic motors we are uh, Oh, okay. ahead of the game on that okay not the shredder. so what do we do in uh, our yeah this is not filament makers this is um, heavy-duty shredders so this this kind of stuff like getting towards like shredding making gravel for driveways is uh, so where you want to go with this so my take is that I think the hydraulic motors just do a better job at being able to take like uh, 
torque and tension and uh, resistance than electric motors as well. And then some, yeah. And then That's an understatement. Yeah, I mean, they're just much more robust, much more torquey, much more lifetime. They're all enclosed. They're self-oiled because they, they're, they've got oil. So as opposed to gears on the outside, like in their system, it's all internal, lubricated in... in uh, what it's, it's called hydraulic fluid, which is an oil. So, um, how do hydraulic motors fail? Basically, because if they lose hydraulic pressure, then that's the only way they lose their lubricating fluid. And then not yeah, if you run them push, dry, but then you can't really run it dry because well, it runs on hydraulic fluid. Yeah. <laughs> so like, um, yeah. So, so how, they're self self they, safe. How do they fail? Well, for example, if you're if you take a car with hydraulic motors down a large hill, uh -huh. you're still spinning the motors by an external force. Okay. So you're going across your Rockies there. Uh -huh. Those nice so multi-mile, like yeah, an insanely far distance. Yeah. And heat them up too much. Yeah. And it. there'll be a little bit of residual hydraulic fluid in there. And actually, if you're not putting a lot of force on them, it should it's still be fine. It's like, fine, yeah. yeah. So that's cool. Cool thing. Did you have one fail on you ever, or? No, I haven't really had them fail. Like these ones, no. What you can see is leaks, like if you blow out a seal, because they do have rubber seals. Um, haven't really seen that. I have seen the small pumps, which are connected to the engine. Their seals can blow up. Yeah, like if they're driven dry, yeah, they they heat up and and get destroyed. They, you can't pump them anymore. Um, but no, they're quite robust. The cool thing about it is, like compared to electric, here you've got enclosed parts, so it's good for dirty environments. That's a that's a cool thing. Um, and they have so much torque that you can you can drive them at multiple range of speeds. Like you can go super slow. So for example, you can have a single solar panel, like 300 watts, on our tractor, and we will move that. It will move slow. It will move like very slow but it will have the same torque it will still push that 4,000 pounds yeah. so you can think of for example a great application of these solar hydraulics which I think is coming that's that's like everything's gonna go to solar autonomous hydraulic because uh, or it could be electric too but hydraulic is easier uh, the complexity and cost factor is it's literally like 10x over over electric right now or wind flywheel, uh, flywheel hydraulics. Wind flywheel to hydraulics, you'll need some wind some wind to do it, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, just to total aside, do you have any sense how long we'll be in this flow? Just because I have some important phone call that I have to make. Ten minute lesson. Okay, cool. Right on. So, what do we have here? Like that's the current design, so I mean, there's, there's nothing here, but uh, so hydraulic motors, they're actually just put two of them on. What, what you could do is you can have a gear between the two shafts to dr where one shaft drives the other. Here, you, we, since we have spare motors, we can use them directly. They're connected through chain couplers, double, uh, double chain couplers with 80 chain, 80 weight chain, which has like a working strength of like 4,000 and breaking strength of like 20,000 pounds or so. There's plenty of uh, give and uh, strengthen the couplers. Uh, it gets you twice the torque. So um, if you drive it with two motors, you've got twice the torque. Um, the bearings are on the outside. It's a box, half inch steel, eight inch. We need a table for this. Underneath it, we want to put a screen that's, that conforms to the actual blade. Well, since our blades. So here what I did on the blades. What's, what's this blade stuff happening here? That's cut out of a, an 8 by 8 square and just drew something up. Um, but the thing about this is that if you have this on a shaft, if you just did a circle, they'd hard, hardly meet up. But if you do it on this diagonal there, they will overlap quite a bit. So this blade using 8 by 8 inch, uh, half inch wide, half inch thick plate, you can get good overlap of the blades because you do want that. You want them moving against each other like, like scissors. That's kind of a scissor action there. Now the blades in the middle, like they won't engage much. You might have like a, like the blades in the middle, they might allow like bigger chunks to fall in. 
So in fact, this kind of blade design might be advantages to chewing up things that in the video that we were watching right, yesterday, maybe. they would actually chew things up. Because for example, imagine you put a round thing inside the shredder, well, the teeth can't really grab it, but now if you have that flat spot, oh yeah, the teeth um, might grab that because it falls deeper down into the mouth. So, I don't know, maybe this will actually work better for grabbing, hard to grab well, things. But, if you lie, it's but it's not as efficient in terms of how many bites you take per, mm -hmm. per minute, because mostly the outer teeth will be doing a lot of the biting. The shapes of those uh, machines that the swallow the plastic, they are round, but the teeth were only like three or four of them, and they were kind of square themselves. So even though it was a round shape, yeah. I think they sort of thought out that process of having something that looks into it. Like the, the, well, it's, it's the teeth. Invariable, yeah, it's invariable enough to swallow pretty big things, but it has considerably less teeth. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just, there's different ones. There's the ones that have a lot of teeth for, for like taking more small bites for a smaller particle size. If you've got bigger teeth, you just grab bigger bites of things. Like the big shredders for rocks and things, yeah, they're huge and the only have a few. The leads to basically the, the furthest, longest point. Um, so the corners of the of the cutting blade, the shredding blade, need to basically practically touch the the spacer of the other shot, right? Yeah, no. practically touch. Come close to it. Like I would leave some gap, like tenth inch or something. Yeah. Um, but what do we got? Okay. So I feel like in my mind this whole entire time, I was imagining that these blades were going to corkscrew up both of the shafts and sort of turn it in with each other. But these are distinct blades that are here. That What's missing here? Uh, we're not drawing the... They're distinct blades hung on a square shaft. So the cutout there is... <laughs> well, what's missing there? It's the inner tube, right? So what's what this is riding on is that. Ah, oh, I'm not gonna draw it right now. But you see the cutout is square. That's the the four inch tube, oh, okay. half inch wall, which goes around the shaft. The shaft we. So through the holes, just like we did on the tractor, we weld it on. And that's an easy way to address the issue of having huge hexagonal shafts. Typically, people might use like a hexagonal shaft or whatever. Here, we're taking off-the-shelf 3-inch material and off-the-shelf 4-inch tubing and making it, turning it into an attachment system for high-torque attachment system for blades. So that is not going to slip on you. It's a ge geometrical hold. And we will uh, slip them onto the tube one by one. So these can come off. We can, if you don't like these blades, we'll put on some other ones. If we don't like this, we'll put on quarter inch, uh, ha uh, like eighth inch. Bl yeah, quarter inch is what. Oh yeah. So uh, precious plastic uses quarter inch blades. Here we're using half. You'll get twice the bites out of quarter inch blades, but but twice small bites. And maybe we'll end up doing that because we want higher throughput of smaller particles. So we do less screening and take smaller bites altogether. So how, how do you mount that again? I don't know. A single blade, I didn't catch that. So you've got the square tube on this, right? Around the shaft, on, like on a tractor. Tractor oh, wheels. Rare. Oh, okay. Theoretically. Same thing as on a tractor wheels. Ah, okay, okay. Ah, nice. <laughs> Easy way to do it. I mean, this is a hard problem, but it's a simple solution because otherwise you'd have to get hex shaft, which is a specialty product. It's it's not cheap. Um, and you don't have hex bearings that size. How are you going to get hex bearings of of three inch size yeah. so what you'll notice yeah take a look at uh, the precious plastic video to appreciate the complexity they have to go through mm -hmm. because they're machining everything down they're machining hex shaft down to rounds because you can't get hex bearings we could actually print hex bearings like we've done um, some prints up to like one inch shaft hex bearings um, but if you look at it, it's actually useful to appreciate what they're doing uh, for you to get a feel of how radically we're simplifying this. So if you look at Shredder Pro, build it, 
Yeah, take a look at that video and look look at the heroic effort they're going through. So you got lathes and to make a full and continuous weld. But look at what they have to do. So look at their shaft. That's all machine. Wow, look at this. 94% of people believe company culture is important. Well, look at some Switch. of the insanity. I mean, look My at one how, face. how much effort is it to machine that shaft? Two spacers. And again, a blade. Switch. One face counterclockwise. We well, need the exactness. Etc. So to assemble this shit. axis, you also and start by the bottom nut. Also leaving around one millimeter clearance. The blade, which is already this axis only requires one four millimeter spacer so to start. Done. You don't need this. And you can start putting cool. the blades. On this one, the teeth of the blade should face clockwise. And you should. So, I mean, look at this stuff. That's a little bit of work there. That's what they do. We're gonna just weld, weld, three inch shaft and four inch two together. So, it's easy. Uh, but anyway, look, look at the video. It's a nice video. They do a good job communicating. Uh, so, yeah, and, you know, they, they go the through. The box laser cut plates. They got see, CNC cut hopper, plates. All we're gonna do is electric just, box. Like, take four the starting but optional step is to weld four of the um, thread bars doing, to um, have a faster maintenance later. Job. Then you need to prepare your plate by oiling them, as we will but not paint them due to up. tight adjustment. In terms of now place the bottom plate. <laughs> yeah, we'll throw their shredder into <laughs> Prepare <ours>. the side <laughs> walls and insert that on top of it. <laughs> place it's the nice, two extra mill plates and clamp them together to be able to make the thread. Industrial productivity on a small scale, access to everyone on the planet. That's not it. Ours is more like it. Then remove they them. Talk about even 3D printing. You might need help for this task. This Lift the two axes together and slide them in the box. Then reinstall so the middle plates. All part of the ecology. Here it's a little higher tech. It's great work and it's great. Center the axis by placing Look few static blades. Couplers Measure the distance there, um, between the nut the and the side wall. You have a collection of adjustment spacer. Yeah, that's spacer. I would advise to laser cut a bit more than needed. So we can put Place the, the needed number to make it touch the bearing. bearing on the outside. This will avoid your axis to move. Then install the bearing and tighten them to the same torque. Ideally, if everything is rotating well, then place the fixed place. No, install the gears, close the box and install the last bearings. Prepare the gear rotation plate and install it. Pre install the coupling on the shredder and on the motor. Pre install the motor and then measure the coupling distance, height and angle. Keep the coupling in a good position and tighten them to the required Yes. Top. Adjust the box on the motor with some spacer to keep offset and angle alignment inside the coupling tolerances. Then place the rubber and inside the feed in the motor. Now install your prepared electric box or we use and wire the safety button and the motor. So it recirculates until it gets then the install the hopper size. and the seal. Grease the bearings and the gears yeah, and so on. No, it's time to turn it on. So first connect your motor to a three-phase plug. So that's that. Check if your switching button is in play. Turn the main switch on and turn forward. So you can read your density on the SD screen, or you can connect your computer to get a better reading. What you should be careful is always keeping this identity as much as possible under your motor nominal average. Like for example, the power. So I advise you to try it first without the sieve, and then under sieve to get final brightness. Oh no, I'll, I'll do. You get more detail on different training techniques in our donut house. So for proper cleaning, remove the hopper. I would like to have wheels on it so we can move it. And the top plate. And the blade. We could. Sacrifice the table. No, you'll provide that for you all the time. Heavy. And basic maintenance, uh, don't forget to grease your bearings, your gears, and all your plates. Alright, that's it. That's the shredder pro. Thanks for watching this video. And visit PressionPlastic.com for more information and to get the files, the blueprints, the CAD models, the maintenance list, the bill of material, etc. in our download kit. And make sure to check out how to for improvement and hacks on these machines. Good luck building. Oh, before you leave, I just wanted to let you know that Fresh Plastic fully runs on uh, people like you supporting yeah. us. Because so, we share everything we do over so the online so that everyone can start recycling plastic and work together on this math problem. So uh, if you want to help out or support in any way, visit support.freshplastic.com. Send us Double chain coupler, like a tractor. Well, a tractor, we don't do it, but a tractor, we have a chain from one sprocket to the next. Here we have two sprockets next to each other with a chain wrapped around two of them. It's a double chain, and it's a flexible. It's a flexible coupling, high strength. Yeah. Yeah, but the shaft is not directly connected to the motor. No, I mean, no. That's a good thing. But we can drive. It's not a stiff coupler. It's got play.
we drive each motor, or can drive each motor individually, is that correct? You can, you just because turn I'm on Because I'm wondering even if there could be a configuration where you wiggle one motor back, you know, and... Oh, I mean, see, that's, that's the thing. Uh, yeah. in, um, because here they are fixed, right, with the precious plastic guys. I mean, they, they have right. the gearing, so you cannot control them individually. You cannot control them individually, but, but here we can do differential speed based on speed control of each motor. Yeah. So that would be another feature. The other thing is when you get stuck, like say you right. throw a wrench right. in there, right. 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 <laughs> literally, yeah, you will back up and do that oh. kind of motion. Yeah. We could have, a, for example, a sensor off our controller which says if the voltage reaches higher, or no, 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 pressure gauge. If the pressure gauge on the motor reaches a value, and we have those, we use that in a CEB press. Mm -hmm. That's how we sense uh, where That's we press the brick. So you just do that, reverse it. If you see that happening, reverse it and chew it again. Mm -hmm. That would be custom code. That's not in Marlin. <laughs> yeah. We don't have that <laughs> there. But uh, we wanted to take one of those motors and do something else with it. We could because they're changing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the whole modularity of, of building block construction set approach there. So we use the same thing. We already use those motors, same motors on the large trencher wheel, like the six six foot trencher. We use them on the tractor wheels. We use it on augers, and now we're going to use it on the shredder. We use it on the tractor drive, so it's pretty cool. Uh, same components can do everything. That's why uh, with the construction set approach, you get this other 10x factor of cost savings if the parts are truly interchangeable. Okay, yes, we've got that shredder, but now we got we need to use the second tractor. Well, we could do it, put it on the second tractor, so you can have a, like all this other function based on parts that you reuse, giving you just cost savings, but pending that being easy. Like that's the human interface part is you have to make it super simple to disconnect like Legos and stuff like that. That's what we're driving at to the point that technology simply becomes more accessible to more people. That's all. So in the GECS yeah. and the product ecology, it seems like electric and hydraulic motors and shafts and couplers yeah. and all of those things are like necessary developments for this to truly be an open source system. It is. Like um, if at the end of the day you want to have a ball bearing machine that actually goes down to ball bearings, and it's not too hard, that's basically a grinder uh, type of a grinder. But yeah, you do have to have those components. Right now you struggle a lot with everything being interchangeable because a lot of things aren't like they're all different so there is good work to be done if you make more parts interchangeable so uh, it's easier to maintain the thing it's the control control of the technology goes back into people's hands the same old same old that you hear me saying but because there's so much uh, the standards like standardization is good as long as you don't reduce uh, to to homogeneity but if you have a construction set approach with a smaller parts, smaller set of parts, you don't go to homogeneity because you still keep a diverse system because you can make so many configurations. So the construction set approach is for diversity. People sometimes critique saying, oh, well, there'll be just total mass market herd mentality kind of thing happening here. But no, you still retain the construction set aspects which allow you to do more, not less. So, of 110 <laughs> items, and that's the ultimate construction set there. And this, that's where it's going. People will be able to assemble molecules at that level in the future too. So that's a common. Yeah. But it's unevenly distributed. I literally no. did a workshop a few months ago with uh, NIST on a uh, particle based additive manufacturing. So it is yeah. Right it's a thing. And we might think it's so, so complicated, but no, I mean, I mean technology is just crazily uh, evolving. And then it actually, I think, has implications on that we talked about free will. Well, I mean, I think that does have implications because then. Like, oh, nature versus nurture, well, that completely shifts the equation to nurture and change. Because what, what if you could implant a chip in your brain or some biological system that completely changes who you are? You can make that decision. Is that still self-determination? Is that still free will? You can have the free will, I think, to do that, to augment yourself. But we know that things aren't the way, like, if you're born a certain, yeah, like, I always like to think it's always nurture because... 
That's, that's just my mental model. That's my mental model of how I run my life, but uh, you can learn things, you can expand and all that. I guess, okay, yeah, so that, that's a different take on, on nurture, and it's a nuance I didn't quite catch in our conversation yesterday, more yeah. self-nurture, as opposed to, yeah, yeah so, in that sense, I agree. Yeah, yeah. So let's build some crazy things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's Where are we on now? Let's nurture some metal. <laughs> <laughs> let's nurture some metal. <laughs> <laughs>